Well, unless anybody else has any other business for us, uh, we'll get right to the heart of our symposium and let Dr. Vieira speak on the subject that he's so graciously agreed to address us about tonight. Uh -huh. Dr. Vieira is, of course, uh, well known to us on this call. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know his credentials, it would take me about 20 minutes to read it. Uh, probably, I guess I just prefer to sum it all up in, in a sentence, uh, probably the most educated member of the Patriot community anywhere on the planet, and we'll leave it at that, um, wrote uh, a wonderful book uh, back in the early 80s uh, called Pieces of Eight, The Monetary Powers and Disabilities of the United States Constitution, talking about silver and gold. Uh, but most recently, he's done some research and put together some books and monographs on uh, the subject of the militia from a historical standpoint. So although I'm quite familiar with his pieces of eight, I have yet to read his material on the militia. But knowing how Dr. Vieira writes and researches and studies, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that it's every bit as good on that subject as his other work has been on our money system. Uh, so with that introduction, Dr. Vieira, tell us what uh, what have you found and what are your books and just lay it on us here about the historic uses of the militia in this country. Well, after your introduction, Aaron, I don't know if I can do justice to it. Uh, <laughs> it, it actually goes back to the time of the uh, original 9-11 event, and I had never written prior to that anything about um, – gun rights or the Second Amendment, let alone going back into the historical antecedents with the, the militia. And the 9-11 event occurred, and all the stir about homeland security and then the various legislation that the Bush administration passed, starting with the Patriot Act. And my presumption was, well, now all of the gun rights constitutionalists, patriots, classical liberals, uh, whatever, will now essentially come out of the woodwork and attack what the Bush administration is doing and propose something that is more in line with constitutional principles. And, of course, that didn't happen. All of the major gun rights organizations, maybe with the exception of uh, Larry Pratt, Gun Owners of America, were pretty much quiet on the subject. So I said to myself, well, I need to do a, a little bit of something here. And, of course, I had read a great deal about the colonial period in dealing with the monetary question. So obviously, you can't understand the Constitution without putting yourself in the uh, in the world view and the mindset, you know, having the perspective, if you will, of the framers of the Constitution, the people who lived in that period. So you have to read a lot of colonial literature to be able to understand the way they thought and looked at political and economic problems. So I had read a fair amount about uh, colonial militia structures. And what I noticed, of course, was that, as I said, the gun rights people were doing essentially nothing in this area. So I said, given that that's the situation that was very similar to the situation in the monetary field, no one had really written uh, extensively about the background of the United States Constitution. They seemed to be talking about the gold standard as opposed to the Federal Reserve, but they hadn't really gone into the foundational history. I said, well, I'm going to have to do this. And the first thing I set off to do was to find all of the colonial militia statutes, or what I call pre-constitutional militia statutes, because some of them were enacted by the states after independence was declared, but before the states became part of the United States. So we're talking everything that happened during the pre-constitutional period, whether it was a colonial or state legislation. And there's a fantastic amount of that material. Obviously, there are 13 different colonies they passed literally dozens and dozens of these statutes from the early 1600s, 1630s. Actually, those were usually uh, coming out of the governor's office, uh, colonial council, before the assemblies were set up. But in any event, there's a huge body of this material. And it is all amazingly uh, consistent from one colony to another. And, in fact, one of the things that you will discover is that if you took away certain peculiar provisions in the statutes that were enacted in the slave colony, primarily slave colonies, the slavery was legal in every colony, but the southern colonies that had a, a slave economy, slave-based economy, 
they had particular provisions in their militia statutes that dealt with what were called generally slave patrols and the use of the militia to keep um, order, as it were, um, among the slaves on the plantations. But if you, if you took that out and you took away the titles of some of these statutes because some of them identified the particular colony in the title and you laid them all down together on a table, you'd be hard-pressed to know which one came from Rhode Island, which one came from Virginia, which one came from New Hampshire, which one may have come from Maryland. The uh, similarity is, is really pretty striking. And the militia, of course, during that period of time, were the homeland security operation other than the British Army and Navy. Uh, there really was no standing colonial army uh, within the states or generally to speak of. All right, so I use this as the essentially as the model for my research. And as I'm doing it, I suddenly realized, well, I may be the only person out there who's really thinking about this seriously. So I began writing some uh, break the ice, I would call it, articles for newswithviews.com that began injecting some of these ideas or the conclusions, really, that I had come up with into the articles, little piece by piece, sort of as tantalizers and thought-provoking essays to begin to get people focused on this issue. And then tying it to uh, not so much the international terrorism issue, because I think that's a rather obvious one, We're talking about Homeland Security. At least that's the excuse that they give for the Patriot Act, Military Commissions Act, uh, and so forth and so on. But to the monetary and banking crisis, which I've been writing about others for years as impending, I mean, it's coming someday, the system is in, unstable, inherently unstable. And what would happen when that crisis finally blossomed and you had a major breakdown of the monetary and banking systems resulting in economic dislocations on a massive scale, social uh, unrest, etc. And the response obviously was going to have to be the imposition of some kind of uh, police type operation from the top down. And my own view is that I saw the direction of the Homeland Security Department, all the uh, tentacles of that spreading out into uh, paramilitarized local and state police. It's obvious to me that that organization is not being set up because they're worried about a few uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalists hiding in caves in Afghanistan. They're worrying about the breakdown of the monetary system both domestically and internationally and the consequences it's going to have in the United States from a social point of view. And they're hoping to maintain control of it with essentially a, a police state operation. So, so these things all tied together. And I started writing a, a fair amount, and I'm still am writing that on, putting it out on news with views, and it's being picked up slowly but surely in, uh, on other websites. <clears throat> so the idea is, is spreading out there. It's a little difficult to tell uh, the effect of it. But my next step was to set up a rather uh, grandiose project, uh, which was designed to produce a series of books on this subject along the line of what Aaron pointed out, Pieces of Eight. Pieces of Eight was actually written in 83 originally, 380-something pages. And I added to it, second edition, revised edition, now 1,760-something pages. And actually there will be a CD of that because we don't have any more of the books. They were too expensive to produce. But there will be a CD of that coming out uh, probably towards the end of this month. I think we're going to have it ready to go. But in any event, I work on essentially the same scale because the project is probably about that big or actually maybe bigger because there's a little more historical material on uh, the militia pre-constitutional period than there really was on um, money in that period. Of the, there were bills of credit put out in a number of colonies and states, but there just isn't the same level of, of um, legislation. Although it's very interesting to see as you read the, the, those statutes, you'll see they'll, they'll pass some statute for raising local forces, either directly or out of the militia. And then the next page in the statute book will be a statute for generating bills of credit to pay for this. So the monetary and the militia issues were tied together even from the very beginning. So the project, the first part of the project was to put together uh, essentially a study of each one of the states, colonies and states, all their militia statutes, and then draw from this the principles of the colonial militia. And actually, uh, because I could never get the funding to do that and I needed some 
researchers and staffers to help me out with the site checking and so forth. And so I can never get anybody to fund that. So I've cut that down to a single volume, which will use two states, Rhode Island and Virginia. And I won't go into why I picked those two states, but there's a very interesting historical reason for it from that period of time. And they are typical of a very, uh, um, what I would call, anarchic state. Rhode Island was certainly not um, a state in which they paid a great deal of attention to authority. And Virginia was probably one of the more conservative, if not the most conservative and patrician of the states. And yet you see in the two of them the exact same pattern of malicious structure and operations. So that book is now in, in, in work, and then following that, there's a book that's actually uh, mostly done because it was the first one I wrote to try and convince some people of the merits of this, which deals with uh, how the militia fits into the constitutional structure. And then the fourth one, which is uh, in outline now, will be a collection of two or more model statutes. I'll probably write one for Virginia, uh, simply because I live here. may write one for Rhode Island just to be parallel with the first one. And then if someone can convince me there's a state where they can produce some legislators to actually push the statute, I might write another one for that particular state. But if you write one, they're all going to be the same. And that will be uh, designed to really bring this all up to date with an actual implementation through some kind of state statute. But the first book that was written, all the rest of this is, is what I would call high-level intellectual stuff in the sense that you have to have something of a background to be able to read it. You know, what's this important? Why are we interested in this? So I put out the first book, which is now available. It's called Constitutional Homeland Security, Volume 1, available on Amazon. Uh, it's available for me much more easily and more cheaply than from Amazon. And it gives something of a flying survey of the homeland security problem, ties it into the Constitution, and then focuses on the militia as the premier constitutional institution for homeland security, which you get pretty directly from the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of free states. Stop right there. The only place in the Constitution, the Constitution says anything is necessary for any reason. It doesn't say Congress is necessary, President, Supreme Court, the states for that matter. The only thing it says is necessary is a well-regulated militia, and for what purpose? The security of a free state, again, that's the only place in the Constitution that mentions the word security, and it ties it to the concept of a free state, not just any kind of security, not the security of a police state, but the security of a free state. So it's pretty clear in the Second Amendment that the founders had a very specific and rather far-ranging idea of what the militia was supposed to do. The peculiarity in the Constitution is that the Second Amendment is actually a reinforcer of the provisions of the Constitutional Article 1 and Article 2 that deal with the militia, whereas all the rest of the Bill of Rights are more or less limitations, and that's all they're concerned with, limiting what the anti-federalists were worried about as being potentially excessive interpretations of constitutional powers. The Second Amendment really is a reinforcement of the Congress's power to organize, discipline, arm, train, and govern the militia. They really work in tandem. So the first book is focusing on an overview, and, and it, it's looking also at the political problem here, which is we need to educate a lot of people about this. We haven't had a constitutional militia structure in this country since the turn of the 20th century. There was an act passed in 1903 called the Dick Act, which is the precursor of the National Guard, and it fundamentally changed or purported to change the militia structure of the United States. And anyone who goes into that and the history of it realizes, well, the National Guard is not in any way, shape, or form of the militia. It's an ad adjunct of the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Uh, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with the constitutional militia. That doesn't mean it's unconstitutional. It just has nothing to do with the constitutional militia. But uh, quite a few people believe that it does. So it's really from 1900 the militia structure completely began to break down, although it had been atrophied from the t end of the Civil War on. So the first element in this book is to point out that education needs to be done. And the book, as I say, gives an overview on the problem and the solution. And then secondly, having educated people, organize them in some way. And the book suggests that local organizations of activists be set up, the purpose of which will be multifold. First, to find out who in one's own neighborhood, locale, 
can be recruited for this activity and to spread the information and the idea to people who have never thought about it before. And there are very, very many of those people, including people who are in the so-called uh, gun rights uh, community. I mean, I talk to people all the time who are uh, gun owners and very uh, much in favor of the Second Amendment, and they have never thought about that first clause, a well-regulated militia being necessary to secure the free state. I mean, never. They have no idea why that's there. It's some uh, historical artifact to them. They just they can't tie it in. Their lives depended on it. They could, couldn't give you a coherent explanation. Uh, not the fault of them. They simply didn't, didn't learn it. So it's, it's to identify these people, educate people in the local area, and then form a uh, more or less semi-permanent group, because the ultimate goal is to dissolve these things once the statute's been passed, but form a multi, uh, multi-month or year group, which will do a number of things. First, identify and organize people, obviously. Secondly, begin to look at local conditions in their state in terms of what the peculiar homeland security problems in their area may be. And obviously, some of them are obviously different. If you live in Arizona, New Mexico, California, you have a home, Texas, you have a homeland security problem dealing with immigration. If you live in Virginia, you have many different kinds of homeland security problems. Obviously, people in northern Virginia that border on the District of Columbia have quite a different problem from the people who live in the Shenandoah Valley, different problem from the people who live around Norfolk, the naval bases there. Uh, and all those things have to be considered uh, with particularity, if you will. So that's another element of these groups. They were to begin to bring together on the table a, uh, an analysis of what the homeland security problems were that were peculiar to their areas and how this might be dealt with in terms of the organization and training of a revitalized militia. Because obviously the levels of training, for one thing, that are available today are much greater than they were in the colonial period. And the problems that a revitalized militia organization might deal with in terms not simply of uh, terrorist acts or, or criminal activity or, or immigration, I mean, you might have natural disasters, you might have industrial accidents, you might have, who knows, you can run down a list of technologically new problems, at least new in relationship to what the people in the pre-constitutional era faced. And all of those have to be laid on the table. And what kind of training would be available or would be looked for? Uh, one thinks immediately of uh, uh, kind of medical emergency training that at a rudimentary level that everyone should have, uh, some kind of training dealing with uh, you know, chemical accidents, spills. I mean, I live not too far away now from a railroad line. Uh, comes from Baltimore to a place called the Virginia Inland Port where they take the stuff off the cars and put it on trucks and vice versa. And there are uh, tank cars coming through with God knows what kind of chemicals on them, but I can imagine they're all noxious, pretty noxious. And what happens if one of those things goes over on the railroad line that runs by Route 66 and not too far away from where I'm living? Would the people there have any conception of what to do just in terms of protecting themselves against that before some uh, you know, state agent uh, were to show up to tell them. The answer is, well, they don't. That's quite obvious. <clears throat> so there's a tremendous amount of potential there for uh, statutory provisions. And then after all this material has been assembled, collating it, putting it in the hands of uh, some kind of county or state committees that will that will be made up of people who have a certain amount of expertise that can put this material into the proper form and develop a statute. I would say a model statute, except the purpose is ultimately to pass it, not just to look at it, which will be put into the legislature through legislators who have been brought in this think process, thinking process, as soon as possible. And then, of course, now you've got the organization set up. You've got these people all around the state 
in these small groups, I call them Citizens Homeland Security Associations, for want of a better word, but you can call it whatever you want, committees of safety, committees of correspondence, you know, civil defense organizations, advocacy groups. That's what they are. They're really study and advocacy groups. And then once the statute has been drafted, they become lobbying groups. And one hopes that during the process of assembling this information, they've also been making contact with state legislators, so they developed a, a serious caucus, significant caucus in the legislature, House and Senate, to get the bill pushed to hearings and vote and so forth and so on, the normal legislative process, but with grassroots support already there. And then the uh, sort of the kicker in the system is twofold. Number one, that when this bill is presented to the legislators, now there might be some several thousand of these people organized around the state. And they're activists and they're informed. And the word will be given to the legislators, look, we, we have four or 5,000, 10,000, whatever number it is, of these folks out there already organized. And so you have to realize that that's a significant number of people for lobbying. That's a significant number of people in the next election if you uh, folks choose to vote the wrong way. But the really practical, important point here is that if you pass this legislation, because initially it will have to be drafted to have a large component of volunteerism. You're simply not going to get everybody in any state to agree to uh, adopt the colonial system, which was a draft organization for everybody. There was no way out of it unless you were in one of the very small exempted classes. And I don't think you can bring the legislation back online that way initially. You've got to set it up so that there's a large number of exemptions, and you rely to a certain extent on, on people who I would call volunteers. And this is the kicker, to tell the legislators, look, when this statute is passed, we already have organized 3,000 people in the state of whatever who will volunteer to perform these initial functions in this uh, revitalized militia. So the thing will get off the ground immediately, and that will then create uh, uh, peer pressure and uh, all sorts of reasons for other people to come into the system, and it will expand. And the other kicker is, this is the, from, so from a practical point of view on the other side, what happens if the legislation isn't enacted? Or what happens if uh, one of these major crises, the breakdown in the uh, world financial system for that matter, occurs before the, either the legislation is enacted or even gets into the hands of the legislators? If this plan is followed, then some relatively large number of people will, in fact, already be organized on a local basis to perform some at least local homeland security, self-defense, if you will, self-preservation functions, even if the statute does not appear before the crisis appears. So the organizational activity leaves us with something there of great consequence, even if we're too late in accomplishing the ultimate goal, which I hope is not the case, although I imagine we're pretty far down the road, pretty close to uh, you know midnight on the clock. So that's the basic uh, plan. And as I say, this book, Constitutional Homeland Security, essentially lays that out. Now, I need to say one other thing here. This is not a plan that is similar to what you can find on the Internet in many of these private militia organizations. And I call them private because they either – don't arise under some statute that is they're not actually part of something that's already there in the statutory structure. And I'll go into that in a moment, what is there in some cases. Or they affirmatively don't want to be part of any such thing. Uh, that's the usual line. They're really not uh, uh, very friendly to the government at all. They're suspicious of the government. They assume the government is there to uh, to harm them in one way or another and that they are really they're organizing in reaction to the government or in opposition to the government. Well, Edwin, it's a it's a good point you brought up there because there's a lot of knee-jerk reaction immediately when the word militia is used because those types of groups have been mm. at the forefront of you know, whatever publicity the militia has received in the past decade. By contrast, the the true militia is actually an executive department of the state government. Well, that's exactly right. Actually, the, the true militia is an aspect of self-government. Right. I mean, if I come back to the – I hate using this particular fellow as the example of Mao Zedong. All political power goes out of the barrel of a gun, said Mao Zedong. Well, in essence, that's what the Second Amendment says. 
right? A well-regulated militia, necessary security of free state. Well, what's a well-regulated militia? Second Amendment tells us it's this organization that is made up of the people who are bearing arms. So in order to have a secure free state, you have to have the people themselves armed because that is the ultimate source of security for all political power. All right, easy enough. So the militia is actually a governmental entity or part of the government, and I would view it as the ultimate governmental entity because it is there in principle 24 hours a day. It doesn't wait for an election to occur. Uh, it doesn't necessarily wait for someone to give it authority to move. It already has the authority to move in a crisis situation. These private militia groups, on the other hand, look at themselves really as antagonists to the government. And in the sense that they're looking at themselves as being extra legal, if not really illegal. And sometimes you wonder how far they're willing to go. Uh, whereas what I'm talking about is entirely within the constitutional structure, and it's based entirely upon the uh, uh, colonial experience, which is the defining uh, statutory basis for the word militia in the Constitution. I mean, you go to the Constitution, there are a lot of words that doesn't define it. Militia is one of them. And you ask yourself, well, what did this mean? What were these things that the Constitution calls the militia of the several states when it was ratified? Well, they were in existence. Go look. And they had been in existence in some cases for about 150 years in the, uh, in the earliest colonies. And they all followed the same form. They all had you know, a dozen or 13, 15 principles, depending on how you want to break those principles down, which were uh, consistent, uh, uniform, perpetual, as it turned out. They never changed them. And they start at the highest level of everyone being organized, everyone being armed. It wasn't so much a right to bear arms. It was a duty to have arms. Well, that's like the Militia Act of 1792. It made it against the law to, uh, what was it, uh, no uh, debt to be collected in the form of a gun being confiscated as collateral for a debt. Oh, that's right. That's and right, everybody had to have a certain amount of powder and ammunition in their home and all these things in case the militia was ever needed. If you were ever called on, you could come to arms and defend uh, the shores or the border or whatever. You would. It be. wasn't just you could. You would. You could and you would. This was the, the point. 1792 Act is, is an interesting one to look at because it's really Congress following its constitutional authority to take – basic organizational steps to make sure that the militia were uniform throughout the country. And if you lay that congressional statute down against any pre-constitutional statute, you see that they're just slavishly following the same principles. The only difference is they, in the exemption clause, they include officers of the United States government, which obviously didn't exist uh, in the pre-constitutional period. But that's an easy one to find for anyone that wants to take a look at what the basic form was. You go to the uh, Second Congress, 1792 Act. And you'll find that in the U.S. statutes without any, any difficulty. I think you'll find, Congress has that. I think you'll find Pennsylvania still has a law on the books that uh, a gun dealer, an existing you know, registered gun dealer, whatever the case may be at this point in time, uh, he cannot make a loan against a gun. He has to either buy the gun and sell it back to the guy or uh, you know, just sell it outright. <laughs> yeah, probably. You'll find a lot of those if you go back in the colonial period that, that protected gun ownership against any kind of – in fact, in many instances, they, the guns couldn't be taken even for, for payment of taxes. Right. No debt could, could be uh, executed against, against a, a firearm. Uh, but in any event, going back to the, these private militia people, they're out there, but that's not the thing that I'm advocating or promoting, and in fact – in the book Constitutional Homeland Security, as I say, I use the name for these advocacy groups, Citizens Homeland Security Associations, because I don't want them to be thought of as militia groups. That's not what they are. They're groups that are designed to study, advocate, and petition legislators for statutory reform. It may very well be, and I would hope, that if one of these statutes was passed, that large numbers of the people who had participated in this activity would then immediately sign up for uh, militia service of one kind or another under the statute. And I would assume that, as I said before, if you had a crisis that developed uh, out of the blue before uh, the reforms could take place, that having these people together in local groups where they knew each other and had worked together and had studied some of these issues and maybe had prepared themselves in one way or another, at least on the local 
level you might be able to deal effectively with it because obviously in a major national breakdown of the monetary system, banking system, and all the economic ramifications that will follow, FEMA is not going to be able to do the job. Homeland Security is not going to be able to do the job. And the Army isn't going to be able to do the job. I mean, all this talk about, what is it, the Army's 3rd Brigade or whatever that has now come back for, for training and crowd control and, and so forth as a demonstration unit. Uh, well, okay, so they've got that one group. The whole country breaks down. Now what do they do? It's a joke. They don't have enough people. I think even, that, even, if they were, even if they were acting in good faith, they wouldn't have enough people. If I'm hearing you correctly, and this is the only thing I've been able to put it kind of in a modern context, about the only thing we have left that even looks like a militia uh, would probably be our volunteer fire departments, uh, with one exception, that being most of them now are surviving based on their ability to obtain federal grants to get a new fire truck. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's another problem. Well, let me give you an example of how this works in, the, in, in a typical state. Virginia. We have a section of the Virginia Code called the Military Laws. And the militia is defined as essentially two categories, as the organized militia and the unorganized militia. And I could stop right there and say, well, there's the first point of unconstitutionality. There was never such a thing as the unorganized militia in the pre-constitutional period. I mean, never. You will not find in any one of those statutes a category called unorganized militia. The whole body of, you know, of able-bodied men from 16 to 55 or 60 uh, was organized in some way. They all didn't perform the same functions. They all weren't subject to the same duty. But the organization went across the entire population other than the slave population, of course, who were excluded for the obvious reason that you couldn't put a gun in the hands of a slave and expect them to remain a slave. Right. But there was no such thing as an unorganized militia. So I look at the Virginia statute. As soon as you see that, you know we're dealing with people that don't have their heads screwed on correctly. <laughs> the organized militia is the National Guard, the Naval Militia, which is an adjunct of the Army and the Navy. And then a thing that they call the Virginia State Defense Force. Now, there are a number of states that have these things called state defense forces, and they are adjuncts of the National Guard. There's a specific congressional statute that allows the states to have these things in addition to the National Guard. They're all very small. Virginia's is uh, less than 2,000 people, I think. And their primary function is to fill in for the National Guard people when the National Guard people leave the state for some kind of active duty. So the Virginia State Defense people might come in and take over the National Guard armories. They might perform uh, traffic control or other things that the National Guard might have normally been given to do when the National Guard people are not here. Okay, fine. Everybody else is in the unorganized militia. Now, fascinating that the unorganized militia can be called up by the governor, can be drafted. If you ask, well, how will this happen? Will I personally get a call from the governor? Will they send me an email? Will they send me a postcard? Will some fellow knock on the door? Will I hear a siren going? What's supposed to happen? The answer is we don't know. You can read the statute from now until doomsday. There's nothing in there that tells you what's supposed to go on when the governor calls up in an emergency, remember, when the governor calls up the unorganized militia. Well, what training have I had? None. What equipment do I have? None. Where am I supposed to go? I don't know. What's the hierarchical structure? Do I answer to somebody or do I just do whatever I want to do? I don't know. There's nothing there, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the governor is given a list of incidents or circumstances under which he can exercise this authority. And it's a fairly good list. If you take a look at it, maybe 12, 13 different situations. The one I don't particularly like is in uh, cooperation with federal uh, you know, drug enforcement people, because that opens up a whole interesting can of worms. But the others are your typical uh, uh, natural disaster, or, you know, in, invasion, attack, or run down the kind of laundry list of homeland security criteria. They're all there. But once again, who knows what's supposed to happen if the governor dis decides that one of these emergencies has occurred, calls up the uh, unorganized militia, and there's nothing in the statute, apparently, that, or at all, that gives me any understanding of what's supposed to happen. Except, it says when the unorganized militia is called up, it becomes part of the Virginia Defense Force. 
Now, follow that for a second. Go back to your American history. Everybody knows that the Founding Fathers were very much concerned with a standing army. They didn't like the idea of standing armies. They had a bad experience with one standing army. And they make the militia a completely separate entity. Well, they were. There was the, the militia existed in each one of the states, and then you had the Continental Army. So they were separate entities in fact, and in the Constitution, they're explicitly set off as separate entities. There's the militia of the several states, for which the president is the commander-in-chief when calling on the actual service of the United States. Then there's the Army and Navy, and they come under separate provisions in the Constitution. These are different things entirely. So here's Virginia saying that the unorganized militia, which by hypothesis is supposed to be, at least in principle, the constitutional militia of Virginia, that's everybody, that's all of us who aren't in the National Guard, when it's called up, becomes part of a part of the National Guard. We become part of the Army. Constitutionally impossible. It's an affront to the Constitution. But this is the way this Virginia statute is structured. Another fascinating thing is the Virginia State Defense Force specifically says in the statute is not to be armed unless the governor wants them to be armed. Second principle of the constitutional militia. First one is everybody's in it. Second one is everyone who's in it has a gun, unless he's a conscientious objector. Has a duty to have a gun. First principle of the Virginia statute, no one's allowed to have a gun. Second principle of the Virginia statute is you all become part of the army. This thing is so far away from the Constitution, it could have been written in Stalin's Russia. Right? But it was obviously written by people who had no conception whatsoever of what they were doing. But there it is. All right, There it is. Now, actually, it's pretty good from my point of view, because if you lay out the whole section in the military laws of Virginia that deal with what I'm talking about as the militia, and they have sections dealing with the National Guard. We'll put those aside. Those are fine the way they are. That's part of another structure. There are only three or four or five of these, and most of them are sort of empty sections. They don't say anything more than everyone who isn't in the National Guard is in the unorganized militia. Okay, fine. We can take all of that and rewrite that statute without a lot of tedious work in terms of amending this section and moving this section to that section, all the rest of the stuff in, that would normally be done in any kind of complicated statutory rework. And that's true in most of the states I've looked at. Uh, because my interest has been in the in the original 13, uh, because we have the historical parallel. It would be much nicer to have one of these statutes passed in one of the original 13 first, because we can take the thing all the way back, maybe even into the early 1600s. But you can go to a state like New York. New York is probably an example of the, the other end of the spectrum here. New York has its National Guard, and New York has something that looks like the Virginia Defense Force, State Defense Force. But New York also has a thing called the State Guard, New York State Guard. And the New York State Guard, I would call a vestigial militia. It is not a part of the National Guard. It doesn't consider itself to be a part of the National Guard. But it has a kind of quasi-militia uh, structure, military structure. And it performs the type of uh, homeland security activities that I'm talking about, at least with respect to nation, uh, natural disasters, that type of business. The 9-11 event, they had a lot of people uh, come down to New York City uh, to help out with that. But it has a very small number of people, 60,000 in the total state. Well, you know, 60,000 is what percentage of the population of New York City, let alone the whole state of New York. All right? So on the principle of universal organization it fails on the principle of everyone being armed as part of it it fails and you can go down a whole list but at least it looks more like a constitutional militia than some of the other things that you see in these state statutes so that could be used as a kind of basic foundation you could take that part of the New York statute and build on it it would be a little bit more complicated because we have some amendments to do but there are such things I think Texas has one that's similar to it. There are a number of them floating around. Well, All right, so my, my, goal, my, wait, so my, wait, my wait. goal at this stage now, where I am now, is to get out these 
Constitutional Homeland Security Volume 1 book so people can start thinking about organizing themselves for this kind of a project. I have no pride of authorship here. If someone can think of a better way to do this kind of organization, especially in terms of interaction with legislators, I think that's great. Uh, but my concern is that whenever it reaches the level of some statutory drafting, uh, that people sit down and try to work this out in a, uh, a concerted way because there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do it. I, mean, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and looking at these statutes. And some of the stuff I have seen coming out, not in relationship to this particular project, but it's kind of in general. Every now and then you'll see someone, Montana did one a while back. Someone had drafted a statute directed towards uh, what they thought was a uh, pro-militia reform. And the thing was just way, way off uh, what you really need to do it. And I'm not criticizing the fellows who did it. They just hadn't done the background research. They were kind of flying by the seat of their pants. <clears throat> but the goal here ultimately is to get one state to pass the initial legislation, which will be based primarily on bringing volunteers in. Uh, the statute will be broader than that. I mean, we'll talk about everyone having a duty and so forth and so on, but you, uh, it can be written in such a way that you give exemptions to large categories of people, primarily because we don't need them right away. The colonial situation, they needed everyone that they could drag in because there were few people. And especially as they got older in years, they had all sorts of medical uh, problems that they couldn't deal with. Rheumatism, arthritis, uh, blindness, you know, you go to, uh, loss of eyesight, whatever, you go down the list. You got to be 45 years old, and you're already pretty superannuated for serious duty. That isn't true today. <clears throat> so we may have orders of magnitude more people than we need initially to get the, the, the thing off the ground, statute off the ground in terms of implementation. And what I'm hoping to do is to draft the statute in such a way that we say, look, we're going to give exemptions to large groups of people who simply ask for them because we don't need you all. We've already organized enough people in this state so we'll get the nucleus that we need to make the thing work. And all the rest of you folks that don't want to do this initially, although I'm thinking that any good statute would make everyone in the state attend some kind of training course, one course, few hours per year, uh, sort of like I have to do, continuing legal education. They stick me with 12 hours of this stuff a year, all right? as if I couldn't teach the course in the area that I work in. But I've got to go and look at real estate law, which I never do, right, or family law, divorce law, which I never do. They make me do it every year to retain a, a bar association membership. And so it's required the same thing of people. You've got to go and you've got to take a CPR course, or you've got to take something along that line. Once you've taken that fine, you have your certificate, that's it. And then you're exempted from anything else. Maybe you've got to go and take a gun safety course. We have a lot of guns around. Have a gun safety course, at least for the, the, the kids, 16-year-old to 22, so, what have you. And then after that, you're going to pay a fee for exemption. And the fee might be, let's say, $25 a year. Well, $25 a year times the population of Virginia that wants to be exempted from the militia statute would be several millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. And that all would go into the militia fund, so the militia would become self-supporting. And you imagine what even a small group, if they had 10,000 or 20,000 people in it, could do with $30 million in terms of getting equipment. And tra wouldn't real need training no federal and grants, would they? They wouldn't need. That's right. They wouldn't need any federal grants. This thing that's would be the entirely self-supporting within the state. If you start putting a structure like this together, the first thing the the state's going to do is say, "Well, is there any homeland security grant money available for this?" And then homeland security provides money, and then the homeland security takes over your operation. Yeah, that's right. Not you what you got in mind. And you have to stop that. You have to stop that. It's going to be built into the initial statute. So we got to have some tricks built in. That's why I say if anyone's interested in, in enacting statutes like this, we, we really have to have some kind of committee that sits down and looks at them because there's some little quirks that have to be played with to deal with these other problems. But in any event, the goal here would be to get the statute passed with the least amount of friction from the population, end up with a, a, a cadre of several thousand people who would be implementing it most of them are uh, volunteers. I think uh, some people, like uh, trauma surgeons or whatever, we might have some duty, they have to come. 
for a certain amount of time every year because, simply because there aren't enough of them. Uh, but leaving that aside, you have essentially volunteers. The thing is self-financing through the exemption process. We exclude involvement with the uh, Homeland Security, FEMA, whatever, federal level operatives. And there'd be very good reason for that because they're not part of any malicious structure that's been created by Congress. All right? you, put the, you really put the onus on Congress to pass some kind of legislation, which they probably won't do. It'd be rather difficult for them to do it in any event. Once this statute is passed, it becomes a model for other states, and especially if it's passed at a time when there is some significant amount of crisis, and it works, which I think it would, it'll spread like oil and water. Now, let me give you an example of this in terms of the monetary and banking crisis. If I already had one of these things passed, or I had one drafted, and I could get it passed, and say this was done when it should have been done, three or four years, five years ago, when I tried to interest certain uh, gun rights groups in this, and they told me, go away. One of the aspects that I would have built in, and we'd be building into a statute now, is what do you do in terms of the homeland security to protect your local and state community against a breakdown in the national and international banking system? Well, you have to have sound currency of some kind at the local level, right? Otherwise, everything's going to break down. You return to barter. So we could introduce as an element of homeland security training, militia training and organization, the introduction of a non-Federal Reserve-related currency unit. And the simplest one to use initially would be the junk silver, so-called junk silver coinage, pre-1965 uh, silver coinage, United States silver coinage uh, supplemented by the uh, American uh, Liberty, sometimes called American Eagle silver dollars that the Treasury is putting out, Mint is putting out now. Now, you could add to that at a higher level as well. Uh, the gold coinage it just isn't that much of the pre-33 gold coinage anymore, but there's a heck of a lot of the post-85 coinage out there. And if you tie into that system one of the electronic gold and silver currency systems, such as gold money, and now people know about that, www.goldmoney.com an operation run by a man by the name of James Turk, who's one of the premier experts in gold markets and international banking. He was a banker for many years, thinks Chase Manhattan Bank he works for. Uh, take a look at that fascinating structure that he has set up. Um, Non-fractional reserve, it's a bailment system. You go, go into all sorts of detail about it. But that could be tied in as well. And if you had the, this tied into the militia, or built into the militia structure, one of the things that could be required, would be required, of members in the militia who were in business would be the setting up of a parallel price structure. So let's say it's now you know, four years ago. We're looking down the road. This, this system is going to collapse. We have the militia structure set up. One of the elements is everyone has to have, to some degree, a holding of real money. And you people who are in business in the local communities, have got to set up a parallel price structure. Yeah, you can keep selling stuff and buying stuff for Federal Reserve notes and the junk metallic coinage that the Treasury puts out, but we want you to start developing a parallel price structure. So when people come into your store or when you offer your services, there's a Federal Reserve note price and there's a silver price. Or if it's an automobile, there's a Federal Reserve note price and there's a gold price. So all the people you start to deal with, even though they may not be active members in the, of the militia structure, will begin to think in terms of an alternative currency. So that when the paper one comes down, they'll be able to shift over into this commodity-based currency. And we're not going to see a complete uh, injection of chaos, at least into our own localities. What happens in the District of Columbia is somebody else's problem. Right. That would be, I and mean, if, if we had that now, if this had been going on for four or five years, do you think there would be as much panic in this country now about what's going on in the markets? 
Of course not. No, we'd be laughing about it. Who cares what happens on Wall Street? We're not going to starve to death. Our local economy is not going to break down. Even our regional economy is not going to break down. But let me give you an example of, of the difficulty we run into on this particular subject. I, I have never been able to get anybody to uh, put in a militia bill in any particular state because I haven't drafted one yet, and I haven't seen one that I thought was any good coming out of any other place that could use the model. But years ago, four or five years ago now, I was up in the state of New Hampshire with some state legislators there who were concerned about the money problem, and we came up with a bill to bring the state of New Hampshire gradually back onto a gold and silver basis. And it was, a, again, an alternative currency bill, and at least an alternative in the sense of uh, some tax money was going to be collected in Federal Reserve notes and some in gold and, or silver. And slowly but surely we'd try to expand this and the state would pay it out to the creditors who asked for it. And the idea would get a pump priming mechanism going. Well, to make a long story short, we ran into um, a fellow on the Commerce Committee up there who was uh, very antagonistic to this idea. Well, I think, you know, personal and political reasons he had. And he pretty much squelched it. So we came up with another idea, which was instead of having the, the bill proposed, and you can see this bill. It's on uh, uh, goldmoneybill.org, www.goldmoneybill.org, one word. And that's not my website. Somebody else put it up, so I don't vouch for everything that's up there. But he, he took the bill and he put it up there, goldmoneybill.org. We couldn't get that one through, couldn't even get hearings on it. So we came up with another bill, which essentially said, let's just set up, let's have the state of New Hampshire set up a study commission to determine the effects of fiat currency on the economic soundness of the state and its financial soundness. And the, the bill was supposed to get X number of people, I think three people from the House and three people from the Senate and uh, four people appointed by the governor, and this study commission would simply hold hearings and take testimony, and then it would come out with conclusions, and if there was some bill or bills that it thought ought to be promoted, it would suggest that to the legislature. So I went to the hearing. That was last March, March of 2007. And I get to the hearing hearing, hearing uh, room, and it was absolutely packed. And I'm standing outside because it's not time for the, the hearing I'm going to attend. And somebody asked me, am I, going, you know, am I supposed to be going to that hearing? Because I kept looking in to see who was there. I said, no, what hearing is it? And I said, well, this is not a bill to require state insurers who do business in the state of New Hampshire to pay for medical hormone treatments for transgendered people. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, how many transgender people can there be in New Hampshire that they're turning out this huge number of? Of folks for this hearing. Well, the short answer was they got their people out. Whether there was you know a dozen of them or five hundred of those transgender people, they got their people out. This hearing went on for forty five minutes beyond its allotted time. The whole committee was sitting there, fifteen members or whatever was sitting there taking notes. Finally it breaks up. Now that was the Commerce Committee and the, the fellow who had been the antagonist of the original gold bill apparently had been talking to the members of the Commerce Committee. He and half of the committee then proceeded to walk out before the hearing on this study commission bill. And they walked out very ostentatiously as if to say, well, ha-ha, we don't have to listen to you. So we go in to, to give testimony on this study commission bill. Only half of the committee is there. There are no witnesses whatsoever against it. We had six or seven witnesses in favor of it. No witnesses. And part of the reason that we gave for the study commission was the instability of the markets at the time, including the mortgage markets, the housing market, the bubble. This was in March of 2007, right? So these six or seven people listen to the testimony. They don't ask any questions. We leave. A couple of weeks later, comes back to vote. Uh, I think 12 or 13 to 1 against even having a study commission. The only fellow who voted for it was a member of the New Hampshire Free State Project who had come up there a few years earlier and got himself First. elected. All right, Libertarian, member of the Free State Project. He understood the problem. He voted for the, for the bill. All the rest of these clowns voted against it. 
Well, shortly after they voted against it, the headlines start appearing in the newspapers, crash of the mortgage markets. It was like we were you know, gypsy fortune tellers when we were sitting there testifying. Right? And these idiots refused to listen to it. Some of them refused to be in the room. And the rest of the fools refused to listen to it. So this is one of the problems we have, and the reason that it, that was a problem in New Hampshire was because we had no organized constituency whatsoever. This was done primarily by a group of legislators, maybe there may have been six or eight of these guys, who were self-taught in the monetary field, were concerned about it for obvious reasons. I happened to run into them because I went up to a conference in New Hampshire, Constitution Day conference that was held by the New Hampshire Center for Constitutional Studies and gave a speech on money, as I recall. And I ran into these guys. I guess I was grabbed by someone to put down a table with them at breakfast and said, hey, talk to these fellows. And they wanted to put in a bill to have a New Hampshire state coinage created, silver coinage. And I, they showed me the little draft of the bill, and I said, this is no good. The Constitution says no state shall coin money. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, you can't do this. Might have been a good idea pre-Constitution, but it's not a good idea now. Just clearly invalid. And so they said, well, what can we do to try to stabilize our own state? And I said, well, you may not be able to coin your own money, but a state can choose to use whatever money it wants to in its own governmental transactions. There are even state, uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions upholding that principle as against congressionally issued paper currency. Oh, well, how do we do that? And I said, well, that's easy. We'll just, I'll just write this bill. Well, it didn't turn out to be easy. It's a complicated matter. We had to sit down with the treasurer for a while, make him happy as to how the thing was going to work because he was going to testify in favor of the bill. We got the bill written. But all we had was this little nucleus of five or six legislators, and if anyone knows the New Hampshire legislature who's listening here, their, their House of Representatives is 400 and something members. Every town has a legislator or all legislators. So they've got a very large and diverse group there. Uh, Senate's a little more uh, uh, traditional, I and mean, they, they tend to be more controlled by special interests, but the, the, the House of Representatives is pretty wide open. You get a lot of different opinions in there. And what we had hoped was that even though we only had a small group, if we could get some hearings on the bill and then get it on the floor for debate, uh, it might be able to turn a few heads and the first time, you know, get maybe 100 votes or something, a reasonable number of votes, 20, 25 percent, and that would be the beginning. But what we didn't count on was that this fellow in the Commerce Committee had been there a long time, and he knew the parliamentary games, he knew how to play them, and he did it pretty well. And so he boxed out this small group so that they turned out to be completely ineffective. And they had no grassroots organization to put pressure on. And that's what that was the contrast between the transgendered hearing, transgendered insurance hearing, where the place was packed with people. I mean, literally, it was like sardines in a can. Packed with people. And my impression of it was that they were all in favor of this bill. There might have been two or three representatives of the insurance industry, but the vast mass of people there were in favor of this bill. And I don't care what you say about the problems of your know, hormone treatments those people have. They are not as severe an issue in the state of New Hampshire or in this country as the breakdown of the monetary system. That's inconceivable to me that anyone could believe that. And yet there they were. They were organized. They apparently got what they wanted. The folks who came in were just asking for this silly study commission so we could find out how badly off we were right? a week or two before the mortgage market melts down. They have no grassroots organization. Now, the same day, another interesting thing happened. When we showed up there at the, at the uh, legislative office buildings where it was held, they have a huge foyer in the ground floor. You walk in, great big room. And the thing was packed with New Hampshire firefighters wearing their dress uniforms. And their you know, shop steward union guys walking around with their badges. 
and they were going up to a hearing to testify about needed reforms in their pension plan. Their pension plan was not performing the way it ought to perform. And I thought to myself, these poor guys, if they really knew what was going on, they would be over in the study commission bill hearing because it's primarily the monetary system that's the cause of their problems. They've probably got a fairly good pension plan in principle, but it's tied into a rotten monetary and financial system. Well, of course, they don't know anything about that. But it was just interesting. It was another example. They must have had two or 300 of these firefighters there. Why? Just to show the legislators that there are a lot of these guys and girls out there. And maybe they'd vote. And maybe their families would vote. Maybe their friends would vote. Maybe this bill needed to be looked at seriously. So there were two examples. The firefighters, okay, that's fine. Uh, their pensions are probably important. Transgendered people, well, I guess transgendered uh, hormone treatments are uh, you know, highly expensive. But neither one of those issues is going to bring this country down. And the difference was they could get the, the bodies out there. They knew how to organize that kind of activity. And the folks who were promoting monetary reform at the basic level couldn't get anyone out but themselves. So this militia question, which ultimately may be more important than the monetary one, because if the monetary one comes down, without have, the monetary system comes down into real chaos without having some kind of militia organization going, we're going to end up with a first-class East European-style police state in this country. As sure as I'm st sitting here talking to you on the phone, that's what you're going to be living with. And all these fools out there, if I may use the word generously, because I could use a, a much more harsh word for them, <laughs> who are believers in you know, my right to own guns and so forth, okay, fine. You may go out and have yourself shot on your porch <laughs> resisting the SWAT team. You, know, you may be brave enough to do that. So what? All right? Individuals taking that kind of action will never be effective. They may make a statement. They may become martyrs. But they will never become effective. It was not individual action at Lexington and Concord that drove the British back to Boston. Those people were thoroughly organized because they were also ideologically on the right page as well. So we have, that's another problem we have. But they were thoroughly organized folks. And so all this talk about individual gun rights and, and, and you know, what's the, when they get my gun, they have to take it from my cold, dead hand. In terms of dealing with the real problem that we have, is bunkum, as far as I'm concerned. And the First Amendment, the Second Amendment tells you that. It doesn't say that the right to keep and bear arms by itself is going to give you anything. The right to keep and bear arms is instrumental so that you can have a militia. And the militia is the thing that's going to secure the free state. That's the sequence. The free state's the thing you want. To have that, you have to have this collective structure called the militia. And the collective structure is what shall I say, uh, in, uh, implement, you implement the collective structure by everyone having a gun. That's the reality of the situation. The right team bear is the duty to have a gun. So we have no such organization coming out of the gun rights people. They're perfectly happy to, you know, to keep touting this individual rights theory. Well, where, where you're at on that, Ed, I want to stop right on that point. Now, we know you've had a lot more success with the people within GOA than with the NRA and some of the others. Oh, yeah. Um, but do they, th does a group like that have the numbers of people necessary to take a bill like this and make a good show in the state capitol? Now, when I say a bill like this, I want to break that down just a little bit because I've. this is one of the things that I studied pretty intensely when I wrote that book I did a few years ago called Downsizing Government. Uh, if you look inside the Department of Defense, you find lots of good places to begin pruning the federal government uh, within the Defense yes. Department. Uh, so now we got to look at this kind of like we look at now because of experiences. We got to look at this in pieces. You know, we can't yeah. just go in like you know Ron Paul's got the bill to abolish the Federal Reserve. Okay, that has a lot of chance of passage. You know, sure. right. we've got to have something that attacks a piece of this problem that will start the dominoes falling. Now, in Maryland, when I studied this militia situation in Maryland, we find Article 65 of the Maryland Constitution, and a little provision in there says 
the General Assembly shall pass such laws to promote volunteer militia organizations as may afford them effectual encouragement. Mm -hmm. So there you've all – all you've got to do is show a lawmaker that and say, okay, you've got the Maryland Defense Force, just like the Virginia has the Virginia Defense Force. Right. Let's promote it. You're constitutionally required. This is a place you can spend money, and we, the people, will support you. You know, and go in with that kind of attitude, maybe they would create something out of it. Now, I had sent you a couple of uh, pieces of model legislation that I had done a few years back when I was doing some things with Larry there and gun owners. And one of them <clears throat> was called the Firearms Facility Access Act. And basically it says if the state police uh, has a firearms range, that range has to be open to the public. That's all it says. Very simple, very direct. But wouldn't that be along the lines of what we're talking about in a very small area that we might could actually get some support around and win at that level? That's well, that's where, they, that's where they wouldn't hurt. I, I was uh, looking at coming out of a different direction. For instance, when you set up a militia structure and you want people trained, you require any of the training facilities that are now functioning for the various police agencies to immediately be open to militia members. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you're looking at it coming out from a different direction. You've got these people who are not militia members because we don't have a militia statute set up. Well, they're, they're, going going to be able to use, they're going to be able to use the police firing range in the same way that I can go down to the Marine base at Quantico and use it. Private clubs can use Quantico, although they're cutting down on that more recently. Uh, yeah, sure. I don't see any, any problem with that because they're complementary with an E. They're, they're complementary approaches. The Maryland one is interesting because I think what they were talking about there, I, I don't know the legislative history, how far back it goes, but it probably was along the lines of what was much more familiar in New England states, they had a lot of what was called independent companies. Rhode Island is full of these. Their statute books are full of them. Because in Rhode Island, they had to go to the General Assembly to get their specific charter. And I would come, two or three of us would get together, we'd draw up this charter. And they all looked the same. And we'd say, look, to the General Assembly, uh, Joe Dokes and Vieira and his friend Smith want to form an independent company called the Providence Fusiliers or something. They all had names. And we'll get another 55 people to join us, and we will train on a regular basis and do this and have equipment, etc., etc., etc. And we will be independent of the regular militia structure unless there is an alarm called, unless we're called up to duty. And then we will become part of the uh, such and such regiment of Providence. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we were doing the same things that the militia was doing. We were following exactly the same structure and organization, but we were doing it on our, on our own, as mm -hmm. opposed to coming out regularly. And we were part of the militia. We were just an independent company within the militia. We weren't a separate entity entirely. And the legislature typically would say, fine, here's your charter. We grant this. And there were dozens of these things. There are a few of them still around now. There's the uh, Newport Artillery. There's a, a couple in the Bristol area. Anyone who's ever been up to Rhode Island at Fourth of July, there's a, a parade now that even makes, I guess, national television, the Bristol Parade, Bristol Fourth of July Parade. And they will have in that parade every year, certainly the Rhode Island companies that are still there. They're all ceremonial, obviously. But they'll bring them in from some of the other uh, New England states, and there may be some still from Virginia and uh, and some of the other colonies. Well, if you think that that particular concept would work, I have that bill already drafted, and I could run it through you to see if you can think of anything else that would need to be added or changed, and then we could work with that as a model from that angle. And there's another one that I have, too. When I look at things, I'm trying to look at them in a modern context. What do people right now associate with a neighborhood group that is kind of there when the neighborhood needs it for whatever purpose. You know, your crime watch group, your neighborhood watch. Neighborhood watch, yeah. yeah. And in, in, a, in a you know modern context, that along with our volunteer fire companies are about as close as we have to anything that looks like what a militia would have looked like in the colonial days. Now, what if you 
took that crime watch concept, put it back where it belonged, not under the direction of a city, you know, a, uh, what do we call them, a uh, corporate police force or corporate security operation, mm-hmm. but transferred all the crime watches of the county back to the sheriff and then start deputizing people. <clears throat> Set up a crime watch that actually has the, the context of the true posse comitatus in the power of the county. Well, now, we're set, well, now, yeah, but now we're setting up multiple entities here. Uh, the militia structure, yeah, yeah, they had a sheriff, and the sheriff could call out a posse, but the sheriff had no authority over the militia. Exactly, but the posse itself was in the county, and every member of the county would have been a de facto member of the militia, just yeah, because the, he was. But yeah, but the, 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 the posses weren't called out on a regular basis. The militias were training on a regular basis. It's conceivable that you could have a situation, they certainly did, where the sheriff is out trying to find somebody, arrest somebody. And so he calls out, quote-unquote, the posse because he wants to get 20 people from the immediate area to come and help him. Right. Uh, one of the, they were all, if they were able-bodied, they were all members of the militia. But it was not so much a militia function as the sheriff's function. But if you look at the structure of the militias themselves, the sheriffs played no particular part in them. In fact, usually they were exempted from them. Right. right. Well, and I understand we're dealing with multiple problems in the same context, but right now we've got Homeland Security putting grants in the hands of sheriffs for their uh, McGruff program. Yeah, and that's why I don't trust those people or the police. Right. That's why I'm trying to go completely around this. In fact, the ultimate goal here... With respect to the police, at least, not the, the, the sheriffs are a different problem because they come from a different historical uh, source. But local police, state police, county police, town police, these are things that are creation, post-constitutional creations. Right. They, they didn't exist in the colonial period. To the extent that you had police, it was either the posse, or if it really got out of hand, large-scale problem, it was the militia came out. All right. right. Well, and the states created the cities and the counties, and therefore the police departments. And 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 that's right. These are all creations of usually from the state down, because the states authorized the counties or the cities to have police forces. And this is what I've been trying to tell our activists. I mean, the states are really the ultimate authority, the ultimate body of any form of... Uh, uh, power or sovereignty other than the people themselves. Uh, well, it's other than the people themselves, I'm glad you said it, because if you want control over the police, and let's take the example now, you can't go on the Internet without finding some story about local police brutality. Someone's been killed with a taser, you know, somebody's been beaten up, whatever it is. These guys are out of control. They're out of control for a number of reasons. Well, one of them, I think, is because of the increasing federal paramilitarization of these guys, because they, they, they want to get them in a mindset where they are antagonists of the general public so they can be told to clamp down on the general public. All right, how do you control this? I go back to the example of Mayor Lindsay. You remember back in Mayor Lindsay's uh, era in New York, there was a lot of complaints among the black people that they were being oppressed by the New York City police. Probably a lot of truth to it. And Lindsay and the liberals came out and said, well, uh, let's give these people a civilian review board. And when these horrendous stories come out, the Civilian Review Board can look at the situation and then recommend action. Yeah, they'd recommend action. Go to the prosecutors, and prosecutors would file it in the trash barrel. Right? Nothing ever came of that. But they created them. It was a recognition of a problem that the real sovereigns, the people, now had set over them by the politicians this force of oppression. At least that's the way the black people looked at it. All right, well, how do you stop that? In in a self-governing society, the police are not something over me. They're something under me, all right? And the way to solve that problem within the constitutional structure is every one of these police organizations becomes what it should have been in the first place, a subset of the militia. Okay, it has a slightly different uniform. Okay, it's on duty, you know, 350 days of the year, maybe receiving pay and benefits and and Pay and benefits were being given to certain parts of the militia, too, depending on what their service was. But it is not something that is independent. It is not a separate police force. It's an arm of the militia. And when we have one of these brutality situations, the next day, that fellow comes before a court-martial of the people in that locality because he's a member of that local militia unit. 
and he's tried by court martial. You would have no more. They would have one of those trials, and there would be no more police brutality. It would end. Uh, it would end. All right. That's one. That's one of the areas I look down at, at, at this the, the potential of this structure in terms of dealing with all sorts of problems that most people think are intractable that because we the people, as it were, the capital we the people, can't get our hands on the problem. The reason we can't get our hands on these problems is because we don't have the institutional structure to do it. And the reason we don't have the institutional structure to do it is because we've let the institutional structure that the Constitution gave us drift away. Primarily because we've been too damnably lazy. If you go back to Justice Story, Anyone who has read Justice Story's commentaries on the Constitution. Story was a contemporary of um, Marshall, John Marshall. He outlived him, actually, but about that same period. He, he wrote his first uh, first edition, was, I think, 1833, of the commentaries. And he has, he, he goes, it's a textbook, he goes through the Constitution section by section, article by article, section by section, and gives his interpretation of it. And he touches on the Second Amendment, and his point is that the real purpose of the Second Amendment is to have a check and balance between the people on the one hand, organizing the militia, and the army on the other hand, the standing army, because it's the standing army that was, will become the instrument of the tyrant and the usurper. And you have to have the militia as the check and balance against this. So it, as I like to say, the Second Amendment has nothing to do with hunting. Hunters may end up being getting a benefit from it, but it has nothing to do with hunting. It may have something to do with target shooting because you need that to practice using your machine gun. But its ultimate purpose is this other thing. But Story makes a comment, and he said, the, the problem is that people will become um, irked by the duty that they must perform to make a militia function properly. And then they will begin to hold it in disrepute. And then they will begin to treat it with disgust and derision. And eventually the thing will fall apart. He says, this is the problem of maintaining essentially the social discipline, the discipline of the people themselves, to maintain that structure. And that was, that's 1833 he's talking about it. He says, this is already happening. So how long was that from the Constitution? The Constitution was 1787 to 1833, right? Forty years. And it was beginning to fall apart. The first state, which was the first question, historical question, which was the first state that stopped making militia duty compulsory? Massachusetts. Yeah. Mass that's Walter. Mm -hmm. Right? Massachusetts. Lexington and Concord, by eight, the early 1840s, late 1830s, early 1840s. By that time, they had forgotten in Massachusetts the lesson of Lexington and Concord. All right? And then it got worse, because when you had the Civil War, they called up a lot of so-called volunteers and militia groups uh, to fight on both sides in the Civil War. 600-something thousand people were killed, and the country had enough of bloodletting. So the militia organizations uh, reverted to something even worse than they were prior to the Civil War, which is essentially totally ceremonial groups. Fancy uniforms, charity functions, uh, lovely balls, dances, and parties of one kind or another. Uh, maybe they'd have some uh, you know, shooting competitions, but they certainly were not training people to be uh, anything like the colonial uh, militia concept. And fascinating, out of that same period of time comes, I think it was General Dan Butterfield. And Butterfield, uh, besides writing bugle calls, he had noticed in the Civil War that the uh, uh, Union troops, young, young Union boys, couldn't shoot straight, in comparison to the Confederates, at least. And he wanted to begin a training program to get uh, the youth of the country familiar with arms so that if there were ever another major war, wherever, uh, it wouldn't be so difficult to prepare people for actual service. And that was the beginning of the NRA. It was not designed for target shooting duck hunters or, you know, African safaris. It was designed by guys in the Army to train Americans to do what the militia was supposed to be doing. 
And so if the NRA had any sense, this is exactly what they'd be promoting today because now they have the opportunity under this Homeland Security paranoia to sell that idea. And you said, Aaron, you know, how many members do they have or gun owners of America? I don't know how many members gun owners of America has. It's a small group. NRA's got, what, four to five million people? Four to five million. Now imagine if uh, that four to five million in, in the magazines they put out, because everyone in the NRA gets one of their magazines, or two of them maybe. Maybe they also get that political magazine they have. They were putting out every two months or every three months over the past four years well-written articles by Aaron Bollinger, leave, leave me out, right, by Aaron Bollinger and other people who aren't as notorious as I am, perhaps, <laughs> on the necessity for bringing back the militia, on the historical antecedents of the militia, on the constitutional basis of the militia, how this will protect our gun rights, blah, 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 blah. You have four to five million people, plus all the members of their families, promoting these ideas. And that's why I went to them initially. I said, this is the natural constituency for this thing. You know, I'll write this stuff. But they will be the outlet for it. And as I say, it was like uh, my, I could have gotten a better response by talking to Sarah Brady. <laughs> no? We should literally... be laughing, but I... No, she would have called me in. We could have sat down over coffee or something and talked about it. They never even, you know, I never even got to say, come into the office and let's talk. I never even got that much. And the amazing thing about it, Edwin, if they, if they did revitalize the constitutional militia, it would, ab it would do away with all gun control. Yeah, but number one, would do away basically. with all gun control. So that's, that's their ideological goal, right? Their ideological goal would be met. But number two, as soon as you set up the militia structure, you have to have training. That's one of the aspects. They were all trained in some way. And one of the things that I have on my list of mandatory training, even for the people who get exempted, from normal duties, mandatory training, within two years, a person is going to have to take some kind of Red Cross CPR, whatever, some kind of medical, emergency medical training, and they're going to have to take some kind of gun safety training. You know, not necessarily have to go out and learn how to become a thousand-yard shooter right, or, or break down a machine gun, but you better know how to handle guns safely and train at least your own children in this. NRA does a pretty good job of that kind of training. They have two or three courses directed to that. They take a day, or sometimes a day and a half if you go to actually go to a shooting range and do some shooting. So I would think that an uh, organization like NRA would have a terrific economic interest in this kind of legislation because they would be one of the naturals to perform the function of providing the trainers. And you know, Aaron, I'm, you, you know the, the Virginia law, and it's probably true in, in most of these other states that have concealed carry permit legislation. They all have, some, other than Vermont, right, but they all have something that says, well, you have to have taken a course of some kind in, in relationship to gun safety or whatever language they use, but some kind of a gun training course. And usually the number one or number two entry in the approved course list is any NRA certified course right. or an NRA certified pistol course or whatever. You know, however they, but NRA is there, right? They may have hunter safety. They may have you know armed forces. You're in the armed forces. That's okay. But the NRA is right there. So they're already recognized by all of these states. And therefore, if you put in some militia legislation that had that same laundry list, you have to have the training from blah, 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 and number one and number two is NRA. Well, now we're not talking about a few thousand people, as there are in Virginia who have gone through, you know, the prerequisites for concealed carry permit. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. What's that going to do to the NRA budget? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, this is the ultimate work program for them, and it will go on permanently. Because as the kids come up, as soon as they're 16 years old, they're into this program. Yeah, well, and if they want to get a hunting license, they've already got to pass that hunter safety course. Uh, I mean, how easy would it be for them to tweak that to whatever the requirements were in the state law? Yeah, you got it. 
You got it. See? So but when I came to them, I, was, I said, look, it's, it's, it's not just in my interest to do this project, not just something I want to do because I have nothing better to do. It's really in the interest of the country. It's in the interest of this organization in terms of its background. And, oh, by the way, it's in your economic interest if you were to do this because of this uh, training effect. But, they, you know, they're terrified of the word militia. As you said, Aaron, they're terrified of the word militia. When people hear that word militia, especially with little m, because they don't associate it with the Constitution, they see kind of crazy guys running around in the woods with camouflage outfits and AK-47 type rifles. Or paintball guns. Well, yeah, the paintball guns because they can't shoot the AK-47s. If they could shoot the ak 47 they'd be shooting them, right? But they can't, so they use paintball guns instead. All right? it, it's a virtual, virtual militia training. That's the image that the, the, the big media has but created. But the funny thing is our police departments use these same things in their training. Oh, sure. So it's good for them, but we can't have yeah. that. That's the, the concept. One thing I did want to bring out in this, uh, Mr. Vieira, and I think you probably know the report I'm referring to, uh, we hear a lot of times when we talk about this with legislators, state level especially, well, we don't need the militia anymore. Uh, it was actually converted to the National Guard. <laughs> and uh, this is their impression. You know, They think the National Guard is now the militia. So I wanted to uh, just kind of read something in my research. I found the Senate report. It says, and this is the U.S. Senate speaking here, that the National Guard is not the militia referred to in the Second Amendment is even clearer today. Congress organized the National Guard under its power to raise and support armies, not its power to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. This Congress chose to do in the interest of organizing reserve military units which were not limited in deployment by the strictures of our power over the constitutional militia, which can be called forth only to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrection, and repel invasion. The modern National Guard was specifically intended to avoid status as the constitutional militia. Yeah, that's exactly and, and they're right. stating that they did that so that there was no limits on how they could use it, because the militia could only be used for those three limited things, the National Guard is another animal entirely. Well, that's right. But in the two things. First, you could leave that leave that explanation out. All you'd have to do is read the statute yeah, and see what the statute does. But if you know the history here, at the turn of the 20th century, in the late 1800s, remember you had the war with Spain. The war with Spain was fought overseas in Cuba and the Philippines with volunteers. All the Navy was volunteers. The Army was either or professional. The Army was professional who were volunteers or people like Teddy Roosevelt's yeah. Rough Riders who were real volunteers. They weren't actually on active duty at that point. They volunteered. Now, at that point in time, we had a group of political uh, thinkers in this country who wanted to advance the United States into international waters, uh, what you might call imperialist thinkers. And some of them apparently came to the Attorney General of the United States and asked whether the militia could be called up to serve in foreign venues. And the Attorney General said quite correctly, no. Constitution provides for a call-up of the militia for national purposes and only the three instances of execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, repel invasions, and sending the militia over to some foreign country to fight would not fall into any one of those three categories. Ergo, they had to come up with something else, and that was the genesis in 1903 through the Dick Act of the National Guard. It was to create this huge reserve component of the armed, regular armed forces for the purpose of foreign involvement. And the second big act that was passed was 1916, called the National Defense Act, just in time, by the way, for World War I, as if these things were all accidental. Right, and yeah. large numbers of members of the National Guard were sent to fight in World War I, as I recall uh, Alvin York being one of them. Uh, it's national, it's, but it's fascinating to see the propaganda out of the National Guard. And I think this is simply a matter of ignorance, but but they have a poster that um, 
I've, I've seen several different versions of it. it. Talks about the birthday of the National Guard, April the 16th, 1630 something, which is the first formation of the Massachusetts uh, militia. And they said this is the birthday of the National Guard. I think to myself, <laughs> there's, no, there's no connection whatsoever between these two. But the average National Guard member doesn't know that. He's been set a bill of goods. And the average American certainly doesn't know it. Right. Well, it's important that we do know this history, and that's one of the reasons that I wanted to invite you on here so we could bring some of this stuff out. We've got a lot of... uh, you know, former military people and folks that are working in these states, and I've heard this stuff myself personally as I've tried to explain this to some of these people. Uh, we just got to recognize that our state legislators are pretty good representatives of the public at large. You know, they graduated from the same high schools, and uh, some of them have a little bit more education than others, but generally, uh, you know, they haven't done this kind of homework that you've done and some of the rest of us have. So, uh, we, you know, we want to start doing a little bit more of this, and we really need to do just what you said, uh, Dr. Vieira. Have our little, uh, I don't know what we want to call it, uh, committee of correspondence, for want of a better phrase, where we can hash out a couple of, uh, you know, draft ideas and then be able to for- farm these out to some of our activists and uh say let's go get them and and you want also to bring in besides the positives you want to bring in the negatives and we've been talking about some of them that the legislators are going to think about the national guard as the real militia so the I mean, their first question is what are you people talking about we already have that it's called the national guard uh the uh uh, we call that objections and rebuttals, knowing you know what our arguments are going to be against us and coming up with good rebuttals. Yeah, it's not even so much a rebuttal. It's, it, you, you get questions. I call them ignorant questions. They're questions born of ignorance. The person really doesn't know much at all about this. They've heard some little thing, and that generates a response from them. It's not really well, a thought-through argument that they have. It's just some off-the-cuff response that they've picked up from who knows where. Well, Dr. Vieira. Yes? Uh, this is Jim Palmisano. Oh, Jim, yes. Hey, and uh, Aaron, how, how are you? Welcome, Jim. Um, I've been listening along all night. Anyway, um, you know, uh, you know when, you, when people would make a response like that, it's like it's, it's really not that difficult. Um, you know, most of our National Guard is overseas. Sure. Yeah. What, what, what's the plan? How is it going to work when we have a, an emerge, a local emergency? I mean, what's the plan? I mean, you're going to call up the National Guard? Oh, what are you going to do? Uh, wait three weeks or a month to get them back from Iraq? Sure. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, how right. Many, yeah. How many? How many? How many actual National Guardsmen and reserves do we have in the states available for action? And in, a, and in a really major national emergency, do you have enough of these people if they were here? Exactly. And, and yeah. precisely how is the National Guard going to deal with what I've been talking about earlier this evening, a monetary and economic breakdown? Are they prepared to deal with this? Well, and I'd like to talk to you about that real quickly, if you don't mind. Nope, we want to try to wrap up by about 9.30 Eastern, so let's see if we can keep it short here and okay. give everybody a chance to well, get to bed. I'd- yeah, I'd just like to get um, – I would like to get Dr. Vieira's view on, on this because uh, Lyndon LaRouche right now is in the middle of, of, of trying to speak with, with Russia and India and China to come to the table and to, to just bankrupt this broken financial system and revamp it because their views right now – and it's not just LaRouche. There's a lot of economists that are saying – if we don't do something now, this whole thing's going to come down in a matter of months. Well, too damn Worldwide. bad. Why? LaRouche has got a problem. It's called the Logan Act. If he's out there negotiating with foreign governments, he's done well, this no, before. They're not, he's not negotiating. He's not negotiating. He is just talking to them, saying, are you willing to come to the table? Well, you know, the way that act reads, uh, yeah, he's just going out there and talking to them and trying to, to influence them in some way. 
against American policy, which is the way any prosecutor would interpret it, he's got a problem. But the second question I have with this is, what did they have to do with our monetary system? What claim does India have to what kind of a monetary system this country has? Well, no, 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 and and no, don't misunderstand. Don't misunderstand. He's just he's just going out there and saying this worldwide system is is it's over. It's coming down. You can't well, let it stop. come down. Well, the worldwide system is not an American no, problem. No. Well, well, I understand, and he and he is talking about all of the nation states to keep their their financial autonomy, but we've got to get back to a sound system, and we don't have that. Well, but there's only one internationally sound system. That's the gold standard. I saw something very interesting the other day, like a microcosm of this: twenty franc pieces in gold. I had six or eight of them in my hand. And I'm looking at them. They're, they're all the same size because they all weighed the same. Some were French. Some were Swiss. Some were Belgian. And there's the example of the international system. Gold was an international currency. An ounce of gold, if it had a French stamp on it, was an ounce of gold. If it had a Swiss stamp on it, was an ounce of gold. If it had a Russian stamp on it. Unlike these paper money systems, which are all tied to you know asset currencies and debt currencies, we have no idea what the true valuation of them is. And therefore, you have these huge fluctuations. The only way you're going to end up with a sound international system is to have everybody on gold and silver. Are they going to agree to that in the next few years? Never. They're not even going to agree to it in this country until they're forced to the wall. But you've got to do it. You've got to start somewhere. And it just seems to me it's a heck of a lot easier, than what I thought it was, to start in the state of New Hampshire than it was to start in the U.N., let alone Congress. But I'm discovering, or I did discover, that even in the state of New Hampshire, it's difficult to make them understand where their real interest lies. Now we have the opportunity. This is the fascinating thing now. I mean, we're, we're in it. We're swimming in the septic tank. We now have the opportunity to see what the value of one of these reforms is, but on the other side, we've got people who are panicking, and the normal reaction in the panic situation is, well, let's look for the leader figure who's going to give us the, the simple solution. You know what I well, saw, and I've, I'm, I'm writing an article, I sent it to News with Views, it'll be up in a while, isn't it? you can find this, N Naomi Wolf, yes. who has talked about you know, the, the fascist system, this country's becoming a fascist system, well, she's only about 50 years late, right? Anyone who's read any history knows this happened in the 1930s. Uh, but she's got an article. She says, why I'm voting for Obama. And she says she's voting for Obama because, oh, my goodness, you know, the, we, we have this terrible system, and the, the people who are in charge know what they want to do, and they've got a plan, and we're not organized. We don't have a plan. But at least we have this lead, potential leader figure in Obama. I thought to myself, this woman's nuts. Has she ever read the Constitution? It lays out the plan. We don't need Obama. Well, you know, right. she, you know, the, I don't know if you've seen that video that she did lately, but, you know, you, at one point, you sit and you listen to her and you think, you know what, she finally gets it. But then she remains a socialist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Well, but, but, but this is, but, yeah, but this is exactly my point. This is the problem. Here's the crisis, and it's the dog returning to its vomit. <laughs> People should be learning from this crisis that everything that they've been told about the monetary system and the brilliance of our financiers and treasury officials and Federal Reserve officials and the stability of scientific management of debt fiat currency is all bunkum. Well, I'll tell you, Ed, I've got the perfect way to, to wrap up the show tonight on what you just said. Realistically, our president has, what, six powers? Who that person is? really shouldn't matter to us. You if got we're it. following the Constitution, this whole dog and pony show of conventions and parties and, and all this other stuff is superfluous. It really doesn't matter. If that person takes the oath and executes the laws in front of him that are in conformity to the Constitution, it, it wouldn't matter who we put there to do it. That's it. So, you know, with uh, with that said, let's call it an evening. Thank you, everybody, for being part of the call, and we'll be back next week.